Greetings everyone, Gleecon here again with another episode of Lore of Warcraft. We recently left off with a bunch of Let's Plays where we got to the halfway point of the Horde campaign, um, and really that's just because the stories and the lore have pushed that first. Um, in the most recent one, Terran Gorfiend went to Stormwind. Um, in the game, he sacked it, took it over, but in the lore, he did go there and look for the Book of Medieval and found out it wasn't there. We know from Chronicles that it's actually held by, um, it's in Alterac with Lord Perinold, and they don't really get into it much more with Chronicles. They kind of gloss over what happens. I mean, I think we're going to push forward with that, but we, we are on a pause a little bit. We've got to do some lore to fill in before we can continue our Let's Plays. So stay a while and listen to this one. It is chapter 10 of Beyond the Dark Portal. We'll divide into two groups. Gorfin instructed Fenris, Tagar, and his Death Knights. Around them was the bustle of a camp being broken as swiftly as possible. I need... He glanced up as the sound stilled abruptly. Deathwing had rejoined them, looking as perfectly human as he had before. He caught Gorfin's eye. <coughs> Excuse me. What? Did you think I would not return? No, of course I did. Something about how he said it obviously displeased the great dragon whose black brows drew together. Gorfin Fiend realized the words could be interpreted as arrogance and hastened to add, I completely trust your word, Lord Deathwing. The dragon looked mollified. Gorfin continued, We need to travel to Alterac, and from there... To Dalaran, may we ask you for the aid of your children in this? You may. I will summon them now. Deathwing tilted back his head, his mouth opening far wider than any true humans could, and uttered a strange rippling cry that teased at his ears, creating phantoms of other sounds and generating a cool breeze that reeked of old death. Some of the orcs shrank back, and even Gorfiend was hard put to keep his face calm as the earth itself shook and rumbled beneath his feet as if replying directly to the Black Dragon Lord. Finally, Deathwing closed his mouth, and his face assumed its normal proportions. There we are, he said, grinning in obvious delight at the discomfiture of both Orc and Death Knight. They will come. Thank you, Gorfin bowed. He turned toward the two Orc chieftains. He was not looking forward to what he had to ask of them, and feared they might balk, but it had to be done. Your task will be challenging but vital. I must ask you to go to the tomb of Sargeras. Tagar growled uneasily. Even the sturdier Fenris looked upset. You send us to our deaths, then? Fenris snapped. Not at all. There is an artifact there that Nerjul requires. I will send along Ragnarok to aid you and explain what... Gul'dan! The powerful Gul'dan died there, Fenris interrupted. We have heard the stories of how Gul'dan raised it from the ocean bed, only to be attacked by the monstrous things guarding that horrible place. We have heard how only a few escaped and that most died there, screaming in pain. Evil lives in that darkness, Gorfiend. The Death Knight spared only a moment to be amused at the comment. He well knew that the humans on this world thought the orcs themselves monstrous evil things. Do you think I would send you in one of my own knights if I believed you would not be successful? They had no answer for that and exchanged uneasy glances. Gorfin graced them with his death rictus smile. That's better. As I was saying, you must retrieve a certain artifact. Ragnarok will explain everything. Once you've found it, return to the dark portal as soon as possible and we will meet you there. The Warsong clan won't be able to keep the Alliance distracted and busy forever. Both chieftains nodded, looking more confident. Gorfin regarded them for a moment. Tagar was a powerful fighter, but he had no subtlety and little intelligence. Fenris, however, was clever and subtle enough for both of them, and his bearing told Gorfin he would keep the young Bonejewer chieftain in line. Satisfied, Gorfin turned to the Dragon Lord. Great Deathwing, can you bear them to the tomb? The Dragon Man nodded. We know of the island of which you speak, he said, and here are my children, enough to accommodate both groups, I think. Even as the words left Deathwing's lips, Gorfiend heard a sharp flurry of noise as if a heavy rain were striking, 
its pellets slashing through the air and into the rock and earth all around. Looking up, Gorfine did see dark streaks against the stars, but they were most certainly not raindrops. Beneath his feet, he felt the earth rumble again. Suddenly, he saw specks of bright orange as the streaks increased in size, swelling and becoming diamond-shaped. His eyes widened as he realized the orange glows he had seen was fiery magma in the beast's huge jaws, and the increasingly loud noise was the beating of gigantic wings. Gorfine watched, awestruck, as the dragons swooped down. The very earth shook as the mighty creatures landed, liquid fire dripping from their mouths to steam, glowing and sullen on the earth. They were beautiful in their deadliness. Their scales gleamed in the starlight, a glossy black like a midnight pool, and their claws seemed like polished iron as they perched on the earth or on giant boulders, seeming to Gorfine's eyes a living lethal extension of the earth upon which they stood. When they had all come to ground, the dragons folded their great leathery wings and watched the orcs closely, their ebony eyes staring, their heads swiveling and tails flicking slightly. Gorfine was reminded of a cat analyzing its prey before it casually dispatched it, and shivered slightly. "'Here are my children,' Deathwing announced, the pride evident in his voice. "'The finest of all the creatures of Azeroth,' he pointed to a particularly large dragon nearby, two great horns jutting from its brow. Sabellian, Deathwing announced, and the dragon lowered its head as its name was announced, "'is my lieutenant in all things.' He and a few companions will bear your orcs to the island you spoke of. And as for your John to Alterac, I'll take you there myself. I am honored, Gorfine started to say, but Deathwing silenced him with an impatient wave of his hand. His eyes glittered like banked coals as he continued. Don't get too full of yourself, Death Knight. I do not do it to show you respect, but to ensure success. My plans will come to naught if you fail. I suggest you don't, not if you wish to remain alive. Well, at least as alive as you are now. Deathwing smirked slightly, then he began to laugh, the sound rising from an ordinary human laugh to mutate into something much darker and much more frightening. He threw his head back and lifted his arms, the gesture stirring up a wind that buffeted Gorfine and the others against the rocks behind them. What was he doing? Gorfine wondered for a frantic moment if this whole thing had been some sort of dreadful joke and that at last Deathwing had tired of the game. The flames of their dying campfires flickered and swayed in the sudden gust, casting grotesque, dancing shadows. Behind the maniacally laughing man, Deathwing's own shadow swelled and grew, twisting as if it were a living thing itself, changing form as it rose behind him, vast wings spreading out across the mountain range, engulfing all his dragons and much of the surrounding land as well. For a third time that night, the earth trembled, and this time many of the orcs fell hard to the ground. Sudden fissures split open, scalding steam rippling the space above them, red-orange magma in their depths echoing the liquid flame that dripped from the dragon's mouths. Even as his shadow rose and took on more detail, Deathwing's human body contorted. Its edges grew indistinct as if it were being absorbed into the shadows behind him. Only his eyes remained clear, growing longer and more slanted, taking on a reddish cast from the reflected glow of the flames, but then outshining those thin fires. Still the shadow grew, as did the shifting blurry body that cast it. It seemed to have its own substance now, and was somehow pushing away from the rocks. The body elongated and increased in bulk, changing rapidly to match its shadow. A black dragon, yes, but more. THE black dragon. The mightiest, most powerful, most dangerous of them all. The father of the flight. Gorfine thought he would be the most perfect specimen of his kind, but as the shape before him grew more distinct, the Death Knight realized that Deathwing lacked the dark beauty of his children. Giant plates made of gleaming metal ran along the dragon's spine, from the tail to the back of the long, narrow head. Beneath them, Gorfine caught glimpses of red and gold and white and radiating lines as if molten fire were somehow breaking through, as if the metallic plates fastened onto Deathwing's spine were physically holding him together. The effect was disjointed, disharmonious, and suddenly Gorfine realized why Deathwing was so meticulous about his appearance in human form. His dragon form was flawed. Red eyes blazed now from a reptilian face. Deathwing spread his wings wide, their great leathery surfaces as dark as a starless sky and as wrinkled as an old crone. 
power pulsated from the dragon in waves like heat from a raging fire. Come, little Death Knight, if you dare, Deathwing commanded, his voice now a deep rumble. He lowered his head almost to the ground, and Gorfine actually found himself frozen in place for a moment before he forced his body to obey. Trembling, he clambered up onto the dragon where his neck met his heavily armored shoulders. Fortunately, the unnatural metal plates provided easy handholds. The others emulated him, and soon all Gorfine's band were astride the dragons. With no warning, Deathwing launched himself into the air with a powerful kick and a downward sweep of his wings, lifting them up into the sky by sheer muscle alone. Gorfine clung tightly as the ground fell away, and then Deathwing's wings beat back, beat down and back, and again, and they were soaring, the air supporting them as if the massive dragon were as light as a stray leaf. Sabellian and his chosen followers split off, racing forward and disappearing into the night, while Deathwing banged to the right, that wing dipping so low Gorfine thought it might scrape the ground, and headed for Alterac. Aiden Paranold king of Altrak and prisoner in his own palace, awoke with a start. He had been dreaming, and still remembered vague flashes of something large and dark and reptilian looming above him, and laughing. Perhaps, he thought bitterly, it was a metaphor for his fate. He rubbed his face, chasing away the nightmare, but sleep would not return. Muttering, Paranold rose from his bed. Perhaps some wine would help. He poured himself a glass of the dark red liquid. Read his blood, he mused, and sipped it slowly, thinking about the choices that had led him here. It had seemed so easy at the time, so wise, so right. The orcs were going to destroy everything in their path, so he'd negotiated with them to save his people. He frowned into his glass as he remembered his conversation with Orgrim Doomhammer. It was going to work just fine, except somehow it hadn't. His so-called treachery had been discovered, and the orcs had failed to do the one thing they apparently excelled at, destroy things. Stupid, great green oaths. The doors to his bedchamber suddenly burst open. Paranold started at the noise, spilling the wine all over his sleeping clothes as several large figures charged in. For an instant, he simply gaped, caught up in the sensation that he was still in a reverie as the great green oaths he'd just been brooding about charged into his private chambers. Things got even more surreal as the orcs, what were orcs doing in his palace seized him and shoved him to the door. Recovering his wits slightly, Paranold tried to twist away. Without breaking stride, one of them hoisted the king over his shoulder like a sack of grain, and they continued. They stalked through the palace, past the bodies of Paranold's guards, and out the front doors. Then the orcs set Paranold on his feet again. No, please, I... His cries died in his throat. A vast creature, large as the palace itself, loomed above him a mass of black scales and gleaming plates and leathery wings. The long head, easily as big as he was, swiveled to study him, the red eyes glowing. King Paranold. The dry voice did not seem to emanate from the dragon's long, fang-filled mouth, and with a start, Paranold realized the creature was not alone. Someone sat astride its neck up against its shoulders, or perhaps some thing, Paranold corrected himself, noting the rider's glowing eyes, hooded cloak, and strange wrapped limbs. Hadn't he heard of such creatures during the Second War, as agents of the Horde? King Paranol, the rider said again, we have come to speak with you. Yes, Paranol replied, his voice little more than a squeak. With me, really? During the war you formed a treaty with the Horde. Yes, Paranol made the connection. Yes, he said quickly, yes I did, with Doomhammer himself. I was an ally. I am on your side. Where is the Book of Medivh? The strange rider demanded. Give it to me. What? The incongruity of the question momentarily banished Paranold's fear. The book? Why? I have no time for debate, the rider snapped. He muttered something else, gesturing with one hand, and suddenly Paranold was racked with pain, his entire body spasming. That is but a taste of what I can do to you, the stranger informed him, the words reaching Paranold as if from a great distance as the pain washed across him. Hand over the spellbook now. Paranold tried to nod but could not and fell to his hands and knees instead. Then the pain was gone. He stood slowly, his limbs still trembling, and eyed the two powerful creatures before him, the dragon's burning gaze searing deep into his soul. 
Somehow that stare seemed less troubling than it had before. The pain had helped clear Paranold's head and focus his mind. This could be an opportunity if he could just keep his wits about him. I have the book, he admitted, or rather I had it stowed in from Stormwind, and I know where it is. He brushed absently at the wine stain on his sleeping clothes. I thought I might need it as a bargaining chip. The Alliance has claimed my throne and my kingdom because I helped your kind in the last war. He studied the rider, a death knight, he thought, suddenly remembering the term. Yes, clearly he was a death knight, which meant he held some importance in the horde. Paranold considered. I will give you the book for a favor. The rider did not speak, but something in his bearing indicated he was still listening. The Alliance has stationed troops here in my kingdom to watch me and to control me. Destroy them, and the book is yours. For a second, the rider did not move. Then he nodded. Very well, he replied. It shall be done. We will return afterward, and you will tell us where to find the book. The Death Knight whispered something to the Black Dragon, and it leaped skyward, his wings carrying him aloft. A rustling all around startled Paranold, followed by the sight of several more dark shapes taking flight. Paranold stared as the Black Dragons flew from sight, and then he started to laugh. Could it be that simple? Trade an old spellbook, one he could not use himself, for his freedom and his kingdom's independence? He continued to laugh, aware of the manic quality the peels held. What's going on? came a voice. Paranold started, then realized it was his eldest son. That, that was a dragon, and I think a death knight. Aladdin continued in a shocked tone. What did you say to him? How did you convince him to leave? Paranold laughed on, unable to stop himself. Damn it, father! Aladdin burst out, punching his father in the jaw hard enough to send the older man sprawling. Two years I've spent trying to overcome the stigma you've cast on our family name. Two years! Aladdin glared down at his father, tears streaking his face. You stupid, selfish bastard! You've ruined everything! Paranold shook his head and rose to his feet, but froze mid-motion as he heard a new sound over his son's recriminations. What was that? It sounded like... Yes, like a ballista releasing its payload. The rush through the air and the sudden release of the cargo and the dull whump of the impact. He heard it again and again and realized the sounds were coming from over the rise on the far side of the city. Near the barracks, the Alliance forces had commandeered. He knew then what the sounds must mean and began laughing again. The dragons had begun their attack. Aladdin stared at him, then toward the sounds, then back at him again, comprehension and horror slowly washing across his face. "'What have you done to us, father?' he demanded. "'What have you done?' But Paranold could not control himself enough to answer. Instead, he slumped to the ground and sat there in a heap, shaking with mixed chortles and sobs as he listened to the sounds of death and destruction. He had never heard anything so lovely in all his life. "'Over there,' Sibelian circled, then settled gracefully onto the ground. "'Boats! Boats!' Tagar had asked when Ragnarok had explained the plan." clinging to the great black dragon's neck as they flew through the night. I thought the dragons were flying us to this island. But the Neth Knight had shaken his cowled head. It is far too far for them to fly directly, he had explained. They'll take us to Menethil Harbor, and we will obtain boats there to complete the journey. Fenris had frowned. Menethil. That is the name of a line of kings of this world, he had said quietly. Yes, it is an alliance outpost, Ragnarok had admitted, but it is the closest port to the island. Fenris had disliked the idea, but he supposed it could not be helped. The dragons had set them down on a stretch of hilly land close to the harbor, separated from it by a small body of water. Fenris slipped off the dragon and gazed over the dark inlet speculatively. It looked quiet, but there were lights here and there. The harbor likely would be guarded. He motioned to his warriors, pointed at the harbor, and lifted a finger to his lips. As silently as he could, Fenris slipped into the water and began to swim as the dragons, their tasks discharged, took to the skies. The dragons had flown as close as they dared. Even those in the little town deep in slumber would be roused by several dragons landing right next to them. Most of the orcs were not armored and swam quickly, but those who had bits and pieces of plate, mail, or leather armor had a harder time of it. The orcs emerged dripping and chilled. Fenris glanced at them. Their green faces loomed pale in what light there was, and he frowned. He scooped up a handful of dirt and began to smear it on his face. Coat yourself with mud, he instructed both Tagar and the other orcs as quietly as possible. 
it's almost like he he has very much rogue tendencies as well so we have a second rogue now um i, I would go so far as to say i like i like the thought of him as a rogue him and Garona. you will need to move quickly quietly and without being seen the rest of them complied Fenris felt a quick stab of wistful memory as he watched the faces of his companions turn brown. Once his skin had been this color, once all orcs had been a wholesome earth or tree bark brown, had things been so bad then? Had what they'd gained since that time been worth losing their world for? Sometimes he wondered. He shook off the melancholy and focused his attention on his companions, nodding as he saw they were all just brown blurs in the darkness. We only need a few boats. We'll take those three there, closest to the water's edge. Move quickly, and kill anyone who gets in your way. He glared at Tagar, and only those in the way. Tagar, keep your warriors in line. Silent kills only. We don't want anyone to sound the alarm. Let them, Tagar blustered. We will screw the water with their bones. No, Fenris's sharp hiss cut him off. Remember what Gorfin said. We get in and get out. That's it. Tagar grumbled, but Fenris glared at him until the bone chewer chieftain nodded. Good. Fenris gripped his axe, a narrow-bladed affair with a short haft and wicked edges. Let's go. They crept forward, moving silently across the moist earth, weapons at the ready. The first orcs had just reached the wooden piers when a dwarf walked past, clearly on patrol. He had not seen them yet, but he would any second, and Fenris nodded to the two warriors in front. One of them darted forward, grabbed the dwarf's head, and yanked his axe across the dwarf's exposed neck, severing his head completely. The body dropped with only a soft thud, the head rolling a short distance away, its expression revealing just the beginnings of surprise. They advanced upon the boats Fenris had selected. Another guard approached, this one human, and one of Tagar's warriors dropped him with a single crushing blow to the head. Fenris nodded his approval. He'd been worried about the bone tour orcs, but perhaps they were not as savage and undisciplined as he had always thought. He moved on, then he heard a strange crunching sound and a short breathy wail. Fenris whirled around. The orc was still crouched over his recent victim, and he was making the crunching sound, but not the wailing. Then, even as Fenris realized what the bone tour was doing, the wailing drew out and became words. Ah, ah, the guard cried, shrieking in pain. My legs! It's eating my legs! A cry went up and lights were lit in buildings. Humans and dwarves poured forth from seemingly nowhere and Fenris realized they weren't going to be able to escape this without a fight. He attacked fiercely, hoping to end it quickly. His orcs rallied around him and soon cleared the immediate area of humans, but Fenris knew the docks would be overrun before long. Gotta hate that when you're doing an infiltration mission and one sloppy kill brings the whole camp down. To the boats, he shouted, raising his axe high. They clambered into the three boats, one bone chewer dropping his victim's remains back on the pier, hacked free the anchor lines, and cast off. It was clumsy, but the orcs managed to get all three boats pushed away from the docks and out into the bay beyond. Even as they left the harbor behind, however, a beacon flare f fire flared to light. This is Baronin Bay, Ragnarok said, and the fleet of Kul Tiras patrols it regularly. They will see the beacon and be here within minutes. Then we should be gone before they arrive, Fenris replied grimly. He pulled a pair of oars from the long case set between the benches lighting the boat and tossed them to the nearest warrior. Row! he shouted, grabbing more oars and distributing them as well. Row with all your might! Another, the other boats followed its lead, and soon they were skimming across the water, their powerful arms lending the boat's speed. But it was not enough, Fenris realized as he saw other larger boats racing toward them. Kultiras naval vessels, Ragnarok confirmed, studying their outlines. Admiral Pradmore hates orcs. He will stop at nothing to destroy us. Can we fight them? Fenris asked, but he knew the answer even before the Death Knight shook his head. They are trained. They are trained for... Oh, Ragnarok is a Death Knight. They are trained for ship-to-ship -ship battle, and they can outrun us as well. We do not stand a chance. Fenris glanced up at the star-pocked sky and nodded. Perhaps we don't, but then again, perhaps we do. Keep rowing. They moved the bo their boats moved quickly, but as Ragnarok had predicted, their pursuit was faster. 
The human boats drew closer until Fenris could make out the grim men clad all in green who stood ready at the taller ship's railings. Many of them had bows ready, while others had short swords and axes and spears in hand. He knew his warriors could defeat a larger number of humans if they were on land, but here at sea they were at a serious disadvantage. Fortunately, they had not come alone. Just as the first human boat came close enough for Fenris to make out the men's faces, a dark shape dropped out of the sky between them. Massive wings slapped hard enough to drive the boat back and knock the men off their feet. Then the dragon's jaws opened wide and fire shot forth, engulfing the ship's prow. The tar-coated wood caught at once, and soon the entire boat was alight. The sounds of screaming and crackling fire lifted Fenris's heart. But the humans did not flee. Again their boats closed in, and again a black dragon intercepted it and charred timbers and crew alike. A third time the humans tried, their weapons bouncing off the dragon's tough hides, and a third boat was reduced to ash and bone. After that, the human ships fell back, letting the three orc-captured boats pull away. A cheer rang out from the orcs. They're giving up, Tagar cried from the prow of the boat beside them. They're no match for dragons, and they know it, Fenris corrected. But I would not think they are giving up. Any sign of smaller fires on the other ships? Controlled ones? asked Ragnarok. Fenris studied the retreating vessels. Yes, I see a signal fire and smoke, he said finally. They're warning the rest of their fleet, Ragnarok said. They'll be waiting for us. Tagar laughed from the prow of the boat beside them. The warnings will come too late he proclaimed, licking blood from his axe blade. By the time the humans have gathered their courage to come after us again, we will be long gone with our prize. Fenris nodded. For the first time, he hoped that the bone chewer was right, and that he was wrong. All right, so... Um, what we've just done, actually, this book has... The very next Let's Play in the, in the Horde campaign is essentially what just happened. It's a control of the seas against the, the navy of Kul Tiras. Obviously, in the game, it's more of a war, a big battle, and here it's just going to be them kind of trying to shoot a gauntlet of, of ships with some dragon, you know, covering fire and get through it all. Um, we're pretty close to the Alterac thing, but unless they move on and just imply that after that they got it, I would assume we, before we can actually do the mission where we get that Alterac stuff, um, that we we still have some more chapters to read but we have we can do a let's play on the next one for sure because this stuff isn't even covered in chronicles it's i don't think it's really that important um because in the game they take control of the seas this they're just making their way out um to the island and that doesn't really happen all right so we got this episode in the pipe five by five i'll see everybody next time on lore of warcraft